Hello subscribers, I'm Dark Shades and welcome to my channel. I've started doing um, this channel, I'm starting to dedicate it to, you know, Christian ways of life and the way we interact in relationships and I decided to um, focus on Christian because I'm a Christian and I realise that sometimes as a Christian there's so many expectations on us and people kind of think it have, you know, people kind of view Christians a certain way and they expect them to behave in a certain way and we're supposed to be perfect and it's not like that at all. Um, we're just as vulnerable as anyone else. We make mistakes like anyone else and we need guidance just like anyone else. So I've decided on this channel, I do have another channel called Black Bright News, which is more a bit more political and has stuff to do with immigration but I've decided to focus on the Christian way of life on this channel. And I hope you enjoy it. And please subscribe and share. So this, um, this video is about should Christians have relationships or marry non-believers? Um, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul addresses the Christians of Corinth. But this principle is general and applies to all of us. So 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16. Do not put yourselves under a wrong yoke with the unbelievers. For what partnership is there between justice and injustice? Or what communion between light and darkness? So when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you just from a common sense point of view. I'm not coming from a religious or a um, theological concept. I'm just literally trying to make sense out of what is written and trying to apply it to lives or my life and your lives today. So what is an unbeliever first of all? Well, the dictionary says someone who has no religious beliefs or who does not follow a particular religion. Now, is that what Jesus or God meant when they were referring to unbelievers in the Bible? Um, that's questionable, isn't it? Because an unbeliever, if it's just got to do with them not following a religion, supposing they have all their other qualities are Christian-like without following a religion, you get people who are not religious, who are not Christians, who are not, who don't have any faith, and yet they're the most loving and considerate people. And they actually demonstrate Christ like qualities. What happens to them? Are you supposed to disassociate yourself and preferably go with a believer who is obnoxious, who is rude, who is selfish, who's ignorant? quick-tempered? You tell me. So, a believer is meant to be Christ-like, but because of past traumas, they can behave like unbelievers. And an unbeliever, if they've had a stable upbringing, a nurturing upbringing, they might be the best thing since life's been. And do you forsake them or not include them because of their faith. Um, the text for me is misleading. It might be, do not put yourself with someone who does not have the same Christian values as you. That's what I'd like to think it means. Because someone who is opposed to what you believe in, it could cause conflict, i.e. create darkness. So. Um, Yeah, because you have people, believers, you have like Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, they all believe, don't they? But if you were to put yourself with them, you might have a conflict because, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists and the, um, and the Jehovah's Witnesses, they worship on a Saturday. It might conflict with you. 
I mean, it may not, but there could still be, you know, it could be unequally yoked. You could still not have the compatibility that you're supposed to have, because even though you're all believers, you believe in something different. So, and I've put here, for example, would you yoke yourself with a Jehovah's Witness or Seventh-day Adventist? Seven day Adventists. Their beliefs may differ, but that doesn't make them unbelievers. But it could make them incompatible with you for different reasons. Similarly, when you are entering relationship, what do you have in common with that person you intend to bring into your life? Are your principles and values the same about faith, about money, about work, about children? Are your expectations the same or similar? Do you both agree how household chores should be shared? You'd be surprised how that can be the cause of so many breakups. What about fidelity and cleanliness? Some of these men believe that, you know, they can be polygamous. Are you somebody that wants a monogamous husband? And I mean, when you're thinking about polygamy and monogamy, you have to think about depending on the culture and the tradition of the person, they could still be Christians, they should, could still be believers, but they'll have a different lifestyle. Different culture means different traditions. So does that mean if you were to put yourself with them, that doesn't mean you're going to have a harmonious relationship. It doesn't mean the two of you are on the same page. But yet, they're not unbelievers. So some people get into relationships without discussing things that are important to them to see how the other person feels about it. And a few months down the road, they find out that their partner is unwilling to compromise. And like I said, if you, um, if you decide that you're going to go to a relationship with a um, Jehovah's Witness, it was seven day Adventists, it might seem okay. Okay, they want to worship on a Saturday. Um, that's okay, I'll just worship on a Sunday. That means two days you don't really get to do things together. And that can kind of fall into other areas of the life, other things that Jehovah's Witness do. They might want you to go out and deliver leaflets and, you know, be evangelists. And on Sunday, you might want to stay in the church and cook all day for your patrons or your congregation. And it can cause conflict down the line because you're not spending that time together. You've got, you're going in different directions. So it's important that you ask the right questions when somebody is entering your life. So level one questions, because you don't want to bombard someone. You step in um, very, very lightly. And you, this is like over the first period of two to three weeks. Okay, somebody's showing an interest. You don't just ask them willy-nilly. If somebody's showing an interest in you, these are the kind of questions um, you can ask. I'm calling them level one questions. How did you hear about the church? Because we're assuming that, well, this is based on Christians. So um, I know not all Christians go to church because I don't go to church. I, I pray and I read my Bible, but I don't go to a church, not on a regular basis anyway. So, um, but we're going to assume that um, for the purposes of this video, that you meet somebody at church and you're going to ask them, how did you hear about this church, especially if they're new? Um, are they just passing? Did they get invited? What drew them to the church? Are they new to the neighbourhood? These are the kind of things you can get to know somebody just by asking them a simple question. And when you're asking, you're asking out of genuine curiosity. You're being sincere and you're listening to the answers because this is going to tell you a little bit about the background of the individual. Are you saved? Have you been baptised? This isn't a judgment. This is just to know where they are in terms of their commitment to God. Um. If they were baptised, oh, so where, when, where did you get baptised? Was it in this country? Was it in London? Was it in Birmingham? You know, you don't have to ask all of that, but you can just say, where were you baptised? But letting them, let when they answer that, it can give you an idea about whether or not, which area they were living in at the time. 
Um, and where? And because when you're baptised, normally you have to be in the church for quite a, some time so that they the pastor gets to know you. And it's supposed to be a form of dedication and commitment. So you can assume that there's been a level of commitment and loyalty to a particular church if they're baptised. Um, which church did you attend before you came to this one? That's another interesting question. When they answer, it will give you an indication of whether it was a local church. It will give you an indication of what type of church it was, whether it's the same denomination, same faith. Is it a fickle person you're dealing with? Oh, they were going to Pentecostal here and then they decided to go to a Baptist there and then they went to a Catholic church there. Just to give you an idea, you're not making judgments, you're just asking questions. Um, why did you leave that church? It could be for a number of reasons, but those that reason will give you an indication about that person and their character, like I said, not to judge, but to understand. Um, are, is the response whimsical? Did they have substance, a valid reason for moving? It was in the last town that they lived in. You know, they've just come from abroad. You don't know. Um, if they're open and transparent, they're not going to feel uncomfortable with these questions. But if they're a bit shifty and have something to hide, they're going to say something like, oh, what are you? You're a police officer. Am I being interrogated? Am I being investigated? This is a lot of questions. And they're going to try and make you feel uncomfortable for asking the questions. But that's a sign that they might have something to hide. Because a normal, in quotes, person won't have any problem asking these non-intrusive questions. So you can ask, do you know anyone here? You might say, oh, no, I'm just, I'm just passing. I don't know anyone. That means you haven't really got anything to back up what he's saying. The thing is, when people come into a church, they can be anybody and they can say they're anybody. And not that you're going to um, expect people to lie, but, you know, you do need some kind of vacative. Because these are people like someone showing an interest in you. You need to know and have evidence of who that person is. So I've noticed a lot of people these days. Um, when you speak to them, they're quick to show you their ID. And that is to show their transparency. It's to show you that they've got nothing to hide on the ID, especially if it's a um, driving license. You see their name, you see their address, you see their date of birth. And even if it's just a quick glance at it, you know, it's showing transparency. But at the same token, you might feel uncomfortable. You might think, oh, no, you know, when somebody offers you something like that, you might say, oh, no, it's OK, it's OK, you know. But really and truly, you should have looked at it because you might find it's not even that person. And that person is expecting you not to look at it. And they've got a backup plan just in case you have to look at it hard and you notice some discrepancies or something unusual. So just make sure that you don't be embarrassed um, if somebody wants to confirm that they are who they say they are. You can look at it and say, oh, thanks very much. That puts my mind at rest. Simple as that. And that is the reason why they've given it to you, to put your mind at rest. So you know you're dealing with a genuine person. That This is who I am. Um, yeah, so that's level one questions. Now, level two questions. This is maybe about one or three months in. Um, what is your status? You can't just assume people are single. That is a very bad mistake to make. Some people, the thing is, when people go into a church, the first thing they're looking at is the left hand, third finger, to see if there's a ring on it. Some people take off the ring deliberately. Some people don't want to wear a ring. Some people keep on a ring even after they're divorced and separated because they like the security of having a wedding ring on. Some people just like to wear it on that finger for no other reason than they just like to have a ring on that finger. So whether a person has a ring or doesn't have a ring, 
that's no reason to not, not to ask the question. Are you single? You might say yes. If you say, um, have you been married? That's a good one. Then they have to answer yes or no. If you say uh, if, they're, if they're married, oh, so what is your current status? And the tricky one is when they say they're separated. That's a very, very tricky line because when people are separated, um, sometimes, especially with men, they're separated with a view of going back to their wives. It's very hard for a man to separate from his wife, regardless of what the wife says and does. You know, they, they just like the security of that marriage. So are they divorced? That's what you really need to know. Or are they widowed? If they're separated, you're treading on dodgy territory. They might be, because what would happen is they need to find out where they stand with you before they initiate divorce proceedings. You shouldn't be the one to make them want to divorce their wife. That should be done already. So you'll find a lot of people, they're not divorced. Sometimes, nowadays, because of the financial situation, some people are separated and they're living in the same house, but in separate parts of the house. Some are divorced and they're living in the same house in different parts of the house. So if they're, if they're divorced or if they're separated, do you still see your wife? Do you still see your ex-wife? What kind of relationship do you have? Is it amicable? You're not saying that, but you want to hear what they're saying about that relationship. How did it end? There's nothing wrong with these questions. We've been raised to believe that we're being intrusive when we ask questions. People would make you feel as though you're being intrusive when you ask questions. But if you don't ask questions, how will you know? It's interesting because at work last week, um, they wanted to find out the ethnicities of um, women who were having babies. And the health visitors were uncomfortable asking that question. They felt embarrassed and they thought it was an intimidating and invasive question to ask. And what they were saying is that, look, you know, it's because certain ethnicities are susceptible to miscarriage and all sorts of things through pregnancy. That's why they need to know. So they need to educate the health visitors to ask these difficult questions. So what I'm saying to you is it's difficult. These are difficult questions. You will feel as though you're invading someone's privacy. But if this person has chosen you and wants to come into your life, you have the right to ask questions about them, their life, where they're coming from. If they're going to come into your life, what are they coming in with? You cannot take it for granted that you can just accept people just because they speak to you nicely, just because they've got on a suit and they have a shirt and a tie and nice shoes and a smile. No, it's not good enough. These days, you have to ask questions. So many people are screwed up. You know, another question you need to ask, which I wasn't written down, but which just came to mind is, what was their relationship like? This is probably a level four question with their parents. Their relationship with their parents, especially their mother, is very, very important because men in particular who had poor relations with their mothers could be resentful against women and you're not they're not going to treat you as well as those who have a good relationship with their mother. Some men have caught up with this and they will tell you they've got a fantastic relationship with their mother even though they don't. So it's not the only we're talking about cumulative um, information gathering so that you can build a picture of this person that you're interested in and of course you'd have to be interested in it in him or her why you're asking the question. You're not just asking for the hell of it. If you're not interested in the person, don't go through all of this. You're wasting their time and that's not right and that's not fair. Okay, so um, we're still on what level? We're on level two questions. So like I said, don't take it for granted that they're single just because they don't have a, a ring. 
and that they're in the church and don't assume that they're not married. Many say they're separated and when you ask them later, they will say you never asked me. No, some won't even say they're separated. They'll say they're not married and leave you to assume that, okay, they're either single, divorced or widowed. You need to extend that question, open it up a little bit more. Because later on, when you find out that they're married, right, they're separated and you're thinking that they're married and you're thinking, oh, yeah, you know, we can go off, uh, you know, maybe in six months time we can get married and they're still not divorced. And it only comes up then. Oh, you know, but I told you I wasn't married, but I'm separated. That puts a spanner in the works because that wife might not even want to get divorced. Um, these days, couples don't want to pay for divorce. So you're left with somebody, you've wasted your a year or whatever time because you didn't ask the question, are you single? Are you married? Are you what is the status of your marriage? What is the status? Are you are you do you have you had your um decree absolute? Not your decree nice I, your decree absolute, which says you're firmly divorced. All these things matter. So, um, do you have any children? How many do you have? I remember speaking to somebody. They told me that they had two children. In the end, in the end, they had about ten. Every every minute, they were adding on, adding on, and I'm like, I thought you told me you had two. No, I didn't say I had two. I have two for my wife, and then two for this woman, and another two for that woman and turn out in a ten. That person lied, the same one who was a drunkard, lied and said um, he was a widow. His wife's still alive and kicking. You have to be so careful. You can't, it's a shame that you can't just believe what people say, but that's why I'm saying when you extend the questions and you open them up, people you know, liars have to have a good memory. So they will need to, they'll get tripped up along the way. You need to be specific. You need to ask specific questions. Okay, so um, what else have I got here? How, yeah, how old are the children? Because um, if you're dealing with somebody who's in their 60s or 70s or 50s, and then they tell you they've got a three-year-old pitney, you're going to think like, whoa, that means that's a dependent, and that's going to be a dependent for the next 15 years. Is that what you want? How old are you? If you're a young person, it might not matter. But if you're an older person, that's that's not good. He's going to have to probably have that kid with him on weekends and probably have to take it out here, there, and, you know, give money to the mother. and And then similarly... Um, if if they're adults and they're dependent, are they independent or are they living with you? Because these days, a lot of children live with their parents. And sometimes when a, a, a man um, meets a woman, they're looking to get away so that they don't have to, they've got somewhere else to um, live. Next thing you know, down the line, they're expecting you to bring their kids to live with you. You have to know what you're doing. What else have we got here? So um, asking how old the children are will give you an insight as to whether they are dependent or independent. Age doesn't really give you an indicator of who's dependent these days. But at least you'll know whether or not they're young and whether or not they have to babysit or have the children for the weekends. And Because when you go into a new relationship, you want to be able to be spontaneous. You want to be able to get up and go. And if there are children involved, young children involved, that means you've just got to, you've got that additional layer of concern that you need to think about and plan around if you're willing to accept it. So where do they live? Oh, this is oh, this is about the 
Oh, yeah, this is about the children. Where do the children live? How often do you see them? If they don't live with them, to give you an idea of how available. So I've already said that. Um, and did I ask where they live? Yeah, that's an important question. Where do they live? What, what is their housing situation? Like I said, you know, in one video, I, I was telling you about somebody who um, said that they had a poster put up on their door that said the house had been um, taken over, seized, because the landlord hadn't paid the mortgage. So that person was effectively homeless. So where are they living? What is their living arrangements? Are they renting? Do they have their own home? Um, where, do, where do you work? How long have you worked there? How did you find it? Or how do you find it? In other words, do you enjoy your job? Because a lot of people, they'll tell you, oh, you know, I'm working. They hate the job. They wait until they're in a relationship and then they'll tell you, oh, you know, I can't stand that job. You know, something happened and um, the boss said this to me and I just walk out because they, they, they can depend on you. Next thing you know, you've got somebody lump, you've got somebody, a burden on your hands because they decided that they can walk out on a job. No commitment, no kind of level of responsibility. Looking for somebody to burden. So you need to ask them where they work, how long they've worked there. If they've worked there for a good number of years, you'll know that they're pretty stable. They've worked there just for a couple of years or six months or whatever. You know that they're a bit dodgy. So, um, yeah, and find out if they like their job, how passionate they are about it. That will give you an indication of whether or not, if they say, oh, I don't like it, I just work because A, B, C, D, and E, then you know very likely, especially if they're a narcissist, they're just waiting to get behind your door and then they're jacking the job and you'll be lumbered. So, what's awesome? When am I going to meet your friends? Show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Some of these people, they don't even, they never introduce you to your friends or members of their family. They keep them distant for their own reasons. It's important that you get to meet them. So level three questions. This, these are the questions you ask within about three to six months. When was your last relationship? Why did it end? How did it end? Do you still see him or her? You know, and some of these people, they still in touch with their exes. How do you feel about that? Um, how healthy are you? you? You know, a lot of people these days, they're coming into relationships under the guise that they're healthy. Meanwhile, they've got, under, they've got underlying symptoms that they know about, but they hide it. Wait till they're in a relationship with you, and then they tell you about it. You end up with a bloody invalid or somebody who's disabled, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but tell the person up front. And you could still ask these questions, you know, and somebody could still be dishonest, but at least you've done your best. You've done your best to protect yourself. And also watch them, notice them. Are they behaving a bit strange? you know, with their, with their bodily functions, how they eat, how, they, um, how often they go to the bathroom, things like that. Is, are they healthy? It's one thing taking on somebody, you know, and you're hoping to have a romantic relationship and, you know, be able to go places. And the next thing you know, you've got somebody who's got some debilitating illness that they knew about, and they wait until you're with them or you're married to them, and then they tell you about it. But they didn't want to tell you before because, oh, I thought if I told you before, I thought you wouldn't want to be with me. I'll tell you something. Um, that happened um, with me once. Um, I, 
there was this guy, he would, he wanted, I never actually met him, but um, I asked him if he smoked and he said, um, yes, I do. So I spoke back and I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't see you then. And he wrote back and said, I'm sorry, I told you I should have lied. The thing is, is that people, you have to be very careful that you don't give too much up front. Because otherwise, people will give you the responses you want to hear. So, you know, you have to make it look as though you don't really care whether or not they smoke or whether or not they drink, so that they can be honest and open. Because if it's important to you, you need to know. But some of them, they won't tell you because they know that they shouldn't. Even if you put, like, if you go on a, what are these, are they, these websites, dating websites, even if, if you put non-smoker on there, you'll still get smokers answering your ads and they won't tell you that they smoke because they know you don't want a smoker. And then when you meet them, they'll say, oh, I'm social smoking. Oh, I'm giving it up. Oh, that's not how they talk. But you know what I mean? They might as well talk like that because it's such a load of rubbish. So anyway, so where are we? Level three questions. How healthy? OK, that's where we got into that. Any addictions? They probably lie about it if they do have. Gambling addictions is important because it means that if somebody gambles, they can dip into your pocket and take money out of your purse. They can sell things in your home. Alcohol, alcoholism. Drinking out if you have a little selection or you have a little um, few little drinks in your house, they'll be drinking it out. Another thing with alcoholism is that all their salary, all their money will go on alcohol. If they're smoking, £10 a packet of cigarettes now, you know. For people who smoke, that's like 60 or 70 quid a week on cigarettes that they're burning. Drugs, so they, you know, not supposed to be taking drugs, but some of them say, oh, it's for medicinal purposes. I have a, I have a little smoke for medicinal purposes because of A, B, C, D, and E. Next thing you know, you've got somebody who's bloody smoking like a trooper. Your whole house smoke up, your clothes them stink kind of a thing. So, ask the question. Doesn't mean you're going to get the answer. You're not going to get an honest answer, but you've asked a question. And when you ask a question, just look, look them straight in the eye so you can see whether or not they feel uncomfortable about you asking that question. That will determine whether or not you feel that they're being honest in their answer. And I've already said the relationships, was it good or bad? So level four questions. Now we're getting a bit intrusive, but now we're getting to the stage where they might want to move in with you and live with you, marry you, whatever. So you have a right to know. Um, what's your financial situation? Do you have any money? Any savings? Any investments? Any properties? Are you stone broke? Like I say, these aren't judgments. This is so you know what you're taking on. You know what you're dealing with. Do you currently own a property or do you rent it? How long have you been renting for? You know, when is your contract up? Do you have a contract? Or are you just dossing at a friend's house and giving them a couple of quid? How long have you lived in your current home? That was, once again, this is all about stability. How stable are you? is the person that you're taking on? Are they going from one house to the other, just staying at one house for a year or two years and then they chip, go somewhere else? It's all about stability. Um it's interesting because, you know, when banks are asking questions as to whether or not they can lend you a loan, a lot of the times it's just to see how stable you are. You know, when they ask, you know, when they want to see your um, how you pay your bills, you know, they like to look at things like gas and electricity bills because you have to pay them every month. And then, you know, it's they know that you've got a steady way of paying and that will show them that you're reliable. 
People who have credit cards and they pay them all off at once, you would think as an individual that that's good, that reflects good in you, but it doesn't because it doesn't show them that you can pay over a period of time consistently a certain amount. Now, you won't want to do that because that means you're paying interest. So it's not in your best interest to do that. But from their perspective, they're looking for stability. And I'm only mentioning that because when you're thinking about how long somebody has lived somewhere, shows you how stable they are. Otherwise, they just up and move and go all over the place. Um, and that's, you know, when we were thinking about the relationship, when was your last relationship and why did it end? How long was it? You know, was it six months? You know, how? what, what is your longest relationship? Some people, they'll say they've been with somebody for five years, but they weren't even living with the person for five years. They, they, they kind of dragged it out, popping in, in and out of the relationship, but it wasn't a consistent relationship. It doesn't show stability. Is this the type of person who is approaching you in the church, who wants to be your partner, who wants to involve themselves in your life? So, um, and some of them, like I said, you know, living arrangements, are they sofa surfing, just catching at someone's yard? We don't know. Then come look to the church looking sweet and smelling nice. You think, oh, they've got it going on. They're set. You look outside them, I drive off in one Mercedes. That time it's their friend's Mercedes. And some of these people, you know, they deliberately um, try to entice. They will go to a friend and say, let me borrow your Kiana. May I go to church? May I go look one woman? So they bought a friend's good, good car. That's why if you get, if they offer you a lift, is this your car? Could ask them for the logbook, but that's be a bit much. But honestly, that's what they do. Or well, they rent a car to pick you up from church to make you think that you have got somebody who is stable, somebody who has a little something, something. That's why it's not good to look with your with your eyes. You have to watch behaviour and the character of the person. It's not good enough to see what people have and then let that determine whether or not they're worthy of you. Are you worthy of them? Are you even worthy of each other? Probably not. Um, you can ask all of these questions and still get screwed over by a savvy narcissist, but at least you will have done your best. You would have done your homework. Don't give too much away up front so they can align their responses with your ideals. God warns us about mingling with unbelievers. It's not because he is unfair in intolerant, but it's because he wants to prevent us from making an error that pays dearly in the long run. So this is for our protection. When we're asking all these questions, it's for our protection. It's to make sure no, we're not dealing with unbelievers, those people who do not have God's love in their heart. Because that's what God is. It's about love, consideration, compassion. A generous spirit, humility. And whether you're a believer in, in, in which is a label, or a non-believer, you have to look at the person's character and the person's heart. So um, Christian be Christians, believers and unbelievers, they're just labels. Your characters show others who you are. When you shouldn't even have to tell people you're a believer or you're a Christian or you're saved. Your behaviour should show people who you are. Many will say that there are only bad people among the unconverted. There should be people with bad behaviours. There could be people with bad behaviours who are believers and people with good behaviours who are unbelievers. The most important thing is the state of your heart, how you treat fellow humans. If you are kind, thoughtful, considerate, respectful, does it really matter if you're a believer or a non-believer, especially when you're exhibiting God-like characteristics? Or would you prefer a believer 
who is quick-tempered, indignant, selfish, unappreciative, and inconsiderate, just because she or he is saved or has the Christian label. Who would make a better spouse? Someone can marry a non-Christian and it goes well. Conversely, someone marries a Christian and it ends up in divorce. Marrying a Christian does not guarantee an easy and unchallenged life. Loving God is not a simple confession of faith. It is a way of making decisions, a heart attitude when we face trials, and it's about the values we instill in our children. So I hope you found that useful. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.